In one of my previous videos, we talked about how to grow microbes under laboratory conditions. But what happens if we want to prevent microbes from growing in the first place? That's what we're going to talk about in my next couple of videos. In this video, we're going to focus on the physical and chemical ways in which we can control microbial growth. In a subsequent video, we'll talk about the use of antibiotics and how they can help prevent the growth of microbes, particularly when they're, once they've gotten inside of a human being and are causing an infection. So today we're going to talk about the physical and chemical means by which we can control micro microbial growth. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to be talking about the physical and chemical means by which we can control microbial growth. Before we start talking about the different ways in which we can use physical and chemical means to control microbial growth, let's start by asking ourselves, what level of cleanliness are we hoping to achieve? There are four major uh, distinctions when we're talking about levels of cleanliness and which one we need to utilize or which level of cleanliness we need to achieve kind of depends on what it is we're looking to do. So the most stringent level of cleanliness is sterilization. Sterilization is going to be the result of a procedure or an exposure to a certain chemical that is going to do the following. First off, we're going to have to destroy all living cells. So anything like bacteria, protists, those are all going to be killed by a sterilization technique. It's also going to kill off or destroy viruses. Technically, viruses aren't alive, so we typically refer to them as being destroyed. Basically, we're rendering them no longer pathogenic. But the big thing that we're going to get rid of through a sterilization procedure are endospores. Remember, endospores are those really tough, hard to get rid of structures that some gram positive bacteria uh, are able to form. And if we're going to utilize something in a medical setting, typically we're going to want that to be sterilized to get rid of all potential pathogens. Note the one thing that we're not going to get rid of through a sterilization procedure are prions. Those are those misfolded proteins that cause uh, spongiform encephalopathies. We just don't have a procedure to get rid of those at this point, except perhaps carbonizing them through incineration. Uh, but that's not going to be particularly useful in a medical setting. The next level down from that is disinfection. So disinfection is going to be the use of chemicals or, or a physical technique that is going to kill all living cells. It's going to destroy viruses, um, but it's not going to kill endospores. So if we're simply disinfecting something, that is not going to be something uh, that we're going to be able to utilize inside of a patient. So it can't be something that you're implanting or something that you're going to cut a patient open with or use to treat a wound, for example, because we're not going to be killing endospores. Uh, and the endospores are potentially pathogenic. It will destroy all living cells. It will destroy viruses, but the endospores are still going to be around. And because in some cases those are pathogens, we have to be very, very careful about those. Just below disinfection, we're going to have antisepsis. So antisepsis is basically disinfection, except it's going to be something that's more suitable for use on living tissues. So for example, if we're going to make an incision on a patient or if somebody gets a cut or an open wound, we are going to want to use an antiseptic technique to clean that up. So the chemicals that are typically involved in these processes are typically less harsh. So we'll use things like hydrogen peroxide uh, or iodine. These are things that uh, won't kill the living tissue, but should remove um, most of the potential pathogens. Again, we're excluding endospores from this. So antisepsis is really just below disinfection. Disinfection is typically reserved for inanimate objects, whereas antisepsis is what we're doing if we're going to be doing it on a living tissue. Think your patient, for example. Below that, and the final stage is what we have, what we call sanitization. So sanitization really is, uh, we, we're not really going to remove all things from there. Um, we might, might not even remove all potential pathogens, but we're just cleaning stuff up to reduce odors or to make it somewhat uh, cleaner than it needs to be. So for example, when we do laundry, uh, we're really doing sanitization. We're not looking to kill all the microbes that are potentially there. There might be some viruses around. We might be there might be some some bacteria around. If you're doing your dishes, you're not going to sterilize them or even go to the level of disinfection at most point. Bottom line is we're trying to reduce the levels of potential pathogens or other microbes to a, an otherwise safe level. So what we need to think about when we choose a level of cleanliness, we really need to think about uh, what is the purpose. For example, we don't need to sterilize our dishes for the most part, but if we're talking about a scalpel uh, or another medical device, we absolutely can't just simply sanitize it. We can't just throw in a dishwasher and then use that scalpel uh, to operate the next patient because we could potentially be transmitting to that patient uh, some harmful pathogens or uh, exposing them to other bacteria uh, or viruses or other things that they shouldn't be exposed to. 
Now, when we talk about uh, controlling microbial growth, uh, there are two different types of techniques uh, broadly that we can discuss. Um, and these are given different suffixes uh, to what it is that we're trying to do. So let me explain. Uh, there is the cytal and the static suffix. So a suffix is something you put on the end of a word. So if something is microbicidal, that is going to be a technique that is actually going to physically destroy or kill whatever potential microbe we're talking about. So we could have something that's bactericidal that will kill all the bacteria that's, that it is exposed to that particular regimen. Virucidal, uh, those viruses will be destroyed and no longer work. Uh, you know, germicidal, germs, microbes, microbicidal, microbes. Uh, these are things that are, these are techniques that are going to kill whatever it is. The opposite of that is, I shouldn't say opposite of that, but along with that is microbostatic. So if something is static, it's not killing whatever potential pathogen or microbe we're talking about. Instead, it's just preventing it from growing and dividing. So if we're talking about something that is bacteriostatic, that is something that's not killing the bacteria, it's just holding them in place. It's preventing them from growing and dividing. So if you use a drug or a treatment that is bacteriostatic, it's not going to kill the bacteria, but as long as that particular chemical or treatment is in place, those bacteria shouldn't be growing. If you're a, uh, so uh, microbostatic things, we're not killing them, we're just simply preventing them from growing and dividing. Regardless of which technique we choose to disinfect or to sterilize, one of the things we have to know is that not all microbes are as easy to kill as other ones. There are differences. So, for example, prions, as I talked about before, we really don't know how to get rid of these uh, for the most part. They're very hard to destroy. Um, there are really no known sterilization techniques or disinfection techniques that will get rid of prions. So kind of file those under, we don't know what to do about these at this point. Endospores are obviously the most difficult thing to get rid of that we can. So any type of sterilization procedure um, is labeled as sterilization specifically because it can destroy endospores and prevent them from being able to germinate into fully functional cells. But even within different groups, there are uh, differences between uh, what's easier to get rid of and what's more challenging. So for example, some protozoa are able to form insisted structures. They're called cysts. Uh, which are very, which are more stress resistant than the germinated or trophozoite version of that particular protist. Amoebas are great at this. Uh, Giardia lamblia, for example, is uh, is able to form cysts, uh, which are typically ingested, and at that point they they can turn into the trophozoite or sort of the living metabolizing structure. Cysts are more challenging to get rid of than the trophozoite. In fact, that's why they evolved in the first place, uh, because as insisted uh, versions of that particular protist, uh, they are more resistant to harmful conditions, uh, which is why they're able to survive in that fashion. For, um, in general, gram-negative bacteria, because of their double membranes, are somewhat more resistant to most treatments than gram-positive bacteria. Again, that's a generalization. There are some gram-positive guys that are more challenging to get rid of than some gram-negative guys, but uh, in general, gram-negative bacteria tend to be more resistant than gram-positive bacteria. Same thing with viruses. So naked viruses actually are typically more resistant to treatments than enveloped viruses. So again, these are not hard and fast rules. These are sort of general rules. But one of the things we have to recognize is that depending on what, uh, what may or may not be in our sample, um, it may be easier or more challenging to get rid of those particular microbes depending on which treatment we are using. Now, there are other factors that may contribute to difficulties in removing uh, certain microbes from surfaces. Uh, things that may contribute is how many bacteria are there? How many microbes are there? Bacteria, viruses, protists, whatever. Uh, the larger the number, obviously, the higher the concentration you're going to have to use or the longer you're going to have to expose it. It's harder to get rid of large quantities of microbes um, than it is to get rid of smaller quantities of microbes. Another thing you need to consider is, are we dealing with a mixed population or is it a pure culture? If you know exactly what you're trying to get rid of, then you can sort of pre-plan and use exactly the dosage or the concentration uh, of whatever cleaning agent or physical control method you're going to be utilizing to get rid of them. If you're dealing with a mixed population that may or may not contain endospores, well, then that's going to require a different type of treatment or a different length of treatment. When it comes to things like radiation or chemicals, the dosage or the concentration matters. For example, when you look at alcohol as a, as a disinfecting agent, which is very common, you want to use somewhere between 60 and 70% alcohol. And the reason why is if you go any less than 60 to 70% ethanol, for example, um, that's not going to be sufficient to disinfect. It just doesn't have enough power there. It's too dilute. If you go higher than that, it actually evaporates too fast and it will, might evaporate before it gets rid of 
all of the potential uh, microbes that are there. So somewhere between 62 and 70% is typically what you find in things like hand sanitizer. Are there any organic materials present? So for example, blood, feces, urine, that's another thing you have to consider. So the reason why this is important is the presence of other organic material, um, as I just described, actually can blunt the efficacy of certain types of cleaning agents. It can absorb those chemicals or break those chemicals down, or uh, it just, basically it can just make it a lot harder to clean things up. So you have to consider that as well. So let's talk about some different physical approaches to controlling microbial growth. One of the most common ways to regulate microbial growth is through the use of heat. So heat comes in two varieties. There's dry heat and there's moist heat. What's interesting is moist heat actually works better over shorter time periods and at lower temperatures than dry heat does. And the reason why is that moist heat actually works by denaturing the proteins that are contained within that particular specimen. So it can denature the proteins that are needed for, for example, a bacterium in order to, be, in order to survive. Without, that, without those uh, proteins, that's no enzymes, no transporters. They basically don't have the ability to perform metabolism and the cell dies. Dry heat, on the other hand, requires longer durations and typically much higher temperatures. We're talking hundreds of degrees Celsius to thousands of degrees Celsius in order to eradicate the sample. Uh, the reason is actually because dry heat can preserve samples if not done properly. So initially at lower temperatures, you typically get a little bit of denaturation and then you get dehydration. The problem with dehydrating most microbes is that sort of just stores them for later and if you just add water back they can sometimes come back alive so what you need to do is make sure if you're using a particularly lower temperatures of dry heat you need to go for a long enough time where you actually kill a sample now if you're going to go for incineration and you're going to go for thousands of degrees celsius well at that point uh what you're basically going to do is carbonize the sample you're going to break it back down into ash and that's the end of it um, but that's not always what we want to do depending on what we're trying to do with that specimen so look at, let's look at some examples of ways of using heat uh, to either sterilize or disinfect some products. Let's start with ways of sterilizing things using heat. The first way we'll talk about is autoclaving. So an autoclave is a device that uses steam and pressure in order to, uh, in order to sterilize samples. So basically you have this giant sealed chamber, well it could be small, but you have a sealed chamber where you pump steam in that ends up resulting in an increase in the pressure, which means you can actually increase the boiling point of water. Typically when you're autoclaving, you're going to be doing it at two atmospheres of pressure, so twice the normal atmospheric pressure, uh, and steam at that, at that particular uh, point will be at 121 degrees Celsius, um, and that combination is typically enough to destroy all living cells, all viruses, as well as all endospores. Usually the time of autoclaving ranges somewhere between 10 minutes and an hour, depending on what the sample is and how potentially contaminated it might be. The advantage to autoclaving is that you are able to reuse the items that you put in there. So if you sterilize a bunch of scalpels, for example, or dental equipment, uh, you can then, once it cools down, use those sterilized instruments in a patient. So the objects are reusable. The downside to this, not everything is great for autoclaving. So remember, these things are going to get wet. So if we're talking about metals that could potentially rust, that's problematic. If we're talking about powders uh, or other things like paper products, not great because those are things are going, to get, are going to disintegrate or become damaged when they're exposed to water. Another way of using heat to sterilize things is the use of an incinerator. Um, incinerators are typically used when you don't want that particular substance back. So if you work in a hospital or if you've ever been to a doctor's office, which I assume most of you have, you may notice that when they use certain things like needles or scalpels or other things, they immediately go into a red bag or a red sharps container. Everything that goes into one of those red bags or red sharps containers is going to a medical incinerator. In a medical incinerator, you're going to be dealing with temperatures somewhere between 800 degrees Celsius and 6,500 degrees Celsius, so really super duper hot. And the end goal and the end destination for all these things is to essentially carbonize them and turn them into ash. Now, the advantage to incineration is it's going to destroy everything. These things are going to be rendered safe. The downside is they're ash. You can't reuse them. Uh, nobody is intending to reuse anything that goes into a red bin, uh, red biohazard bin, or a red sharps container. Uh, they're simply going to be destroyed at that point. Another way of sterilizing thing is the use of hot air ovens. So hot air ovens typically work at lower temperatures. So both incineration and hot air ovens are going to be a form of dry heat. So with the incineration method, we're using very, very high, high temperatures and short periods of time typically suffice to sterilize our samples. With hot air ovens, we're going to use lower temperatures 
sometimes around 160 to 200 degrees Celsius. Um, but we're only going to do it, but we're going to have to do it because of that low temperature for several hours, sometimes even days, to make sure that our materials are sterilized. Uh, the advantage to hot air ovens is you it's great for things that aren't supposed to get wet, so things that wouldn't do well in an autoclave, um, but also things that you want to use so you can't incinerate. The downside is this is not going to be good for things that are flammable, so paper products you still don't want to put in a hot air oven because they are going to uh, burst into flames, and that's problematic. So uh, those are three ways of using heat to sterilize things. We can also use heat to disinfect things if sterilization isn't required. One of the simplest, most common ways of doing this is through the use of boiling water. Boiling water is great if you're looking to disinfect household items. If you really need to disinfect sheets, for example, or you need to disinfect clothing, you can do it that way. You can also use it to disinfect, for example, baby bottles. When my wife and I first had kids, we ran out and we grabbed one of those uh, baby sterilizers. They're these weird things you put a little water in, close the bubble down, put it in the microwave for five minutes. And after like a month of doing that, we're like, this is insane. Our baby's bottles don't need to be sterilized. They can go right into boiling water and call it a day. Uh, boiling is great because it's pretty readily available for most people. Almost anybody has the ability to boil water. The downside is it is only disinfection, so it's not gonna sterilize things. The other downside is things getting wet um, tend to be easily uh, recontaminated. So that there is an issue of recontamination of wet objects typically once they're drying at that point. So pros and cons there. Another great example of, uh, of a disinfecting, disinfection technique using heat is pasteurization. So pasteurization is very commonly used for beverages, things like soda and, and juice and alcohol, like beer and wine. Uh, milk is probably the most uh, recognizable thing that goes to the pasteurization process. Louis Pasteur originally invented the process so that he can prove the quality of beer that he had access to, believe it or not, but then he soon patented it and it's now uh, required in many countries for all of their dairy products. Um, it basically uses short intermittent bursts of heating and cooling to remove uh, microbes or at least drop them to a safe level. The good news about pasteurization is it's going to remove most harmful bacteria or reduce them to levels where they're no longer toxic uh, without altering nutrient content or the flavor of the beverage. The bad news is not all uh, heat resistant bacteria are going to be removed from this process. So we got to be a little bit careful with pasteurization. Um, it is theoretically possible for things to slip through. Another way of using heat to control microbial growth is actually to go to the opposite. So everything we've talked about so far has actually pushed microbes above their maximum cardinal temperature, things that are going to likely in some ways kill most of the bacteria or pathogens that could potentially be in whatever material or substance we're trying to clean. If we go the other way, we go below the minimum temperature, this is a way of performing bacteriostatic control of microbial growth. One of the most common ways to do this is refrigeration. So we put food in the refrigerator, we put milk in the refrigerator, meat in the refrigerator, or a freezer. The reason why is it slows down the growth of the microbes that could potentially cause problems that could lead to the, the, the food products going bad or causing us illness. The other thing to realize is this is just a form of bacteriostatic intervention. So you can put chicken in the freezer. That's not going to kill all the salmonella. As soon as you let that chicken thaw back out, that salmonella is gonna come right back to life. So when we look at refrigeration, if we go below the minimum temperature of most microbes, we have to recognize that this is merely a form of bacteriostatic control. And that as soon as that food or whatever it happens to be warms back up, it's essentially going to remove that bacteriostatic intervention and they're gonna go right back to being fully functional, germinating, reproducing cells. Um, in the case of bacteria and protists, that could be problematic. Same thing with viruses. So one of the reasons why we use refrigeration, for example, is to, provo pro uh, to extend the life of foodstuffs. Another reason why we do refrigeration and freezing is actually to preserve microbes. So for example, if you want to acquire a laboratory sample of a bacterium, one of the things you can do is you can write to a company that supplies them to you and they'll send you actually a freeze dried sample of that E. coli or whatever bacteria you're trying to, to get. It's also another way in which we can uh, store bacteria for use as probiotics. So for example, if you go to a yogurt factory, they will actually have refrigerated or frozen cultures of the bacteria they need in order to culture their dairy in order to make yogurt or whatever their cultured dairy product happens to be. So there is a reason to do it, but understand that that is not a mechanism that is going to either disinfect or sterilize any of your substances. It's just going to prevent them from growing uh, until they return to normal conditions. A couple other physical interventions that we can use to either disinfect or to sterilize 
uh, materials are filtration and irradiation. So we'll start with filtration. So a filter is quite simply something that removes uh, uh, microbes from a, a sample by having uh, a material that has pore sizes, uh, has pores in it. Um, and depending on what size those pores are, depends on what's able to pass through and what's not. So if we use a substance that has uh, pore sizes, if we use a filter that has pore sizes that are smaller than 0.2 micrometers, um, we can essentially make remove all of the bacteria from that particular sample. If we actually use a 20 nanometer pore size or smaller, we can even remove the viruses from that, essentially rendering that particular material sterile. Uh, this is great for liquids that aren't great at, for heating. So for example, uh, liquids that contain um, sugars and things like that, that if you use heat could cause the sugars to uh, decompose or degrade. Uh, it's also how we typically purify air. So if you've heard of a HEPA filter or an, uh, an, an immobilized enzyme filter, these are ways that we purify air to remove uh, viruses or bacteria that could be there. If you ever worked in a biosafety uh, hood, for example, to do cell culture, or if you've ever seen people using those blue gloves where they're in the glove box, those are all going to have some type of uh, filtration system on the top with a filter in it that has pore sizes that prevent the viruses or bacteria or whatever is they're working with from being able to escape into the air. Radiation is another great technique for sterilizing things. Uh, quite commonly, x-rays can be used. There's also gamma radiation or ionizing radiation that can be used as well. Um, typically, what, what amount of that radiation you're gonna use depends on what type of radiation you're using. Uh, also, which type of radiation you're using depends on what application you're using it for. Um, this is commonly used for, uh, for controlling the growth of microbes in food products. So there's a radiated beef and a radiated chicken and so on and so forth. Um, the re reason radiation works is actually um, it can destroy the DNA or alter and mutate the DNA in the microbes that are exposed to it. Uh, this is great because um, it's going to prevent those microbes or those viruses, bacteria, whatever it happens to be, from being able to grow or reproduce. At the same time, it's not going to leave behind any harmful residue. That's the downside to some of the chemicals we'll talk about in a little bit. They can actually leave behind residues that are potentially toxic or damaging to uh, the person that's exposed to it. So I want to talk briefly about some chemical means of controlling microbial growth. Physical methods aren't always possible. You can't sterilize with an autoclave your, your countertop, for example. So it's better to use chemicals to clean those types of things. Very commonly used chemicals for controlling microbial growth are going to be things like chlorine bleach, um, disinfectants like uh, ethyl alcohol or isopropyl alcohol are commonly used in hand sanitizer. Um, iodine is often used on patients to help uh, disinfect areas where incisions might be made. Ethylene oxide is, is used in a process called gas sterilization uh, when you know using an autoclave or a hot air oven just isn't possible. Um, things like that are very commonly used to uh, chemicals that are used to disinfect or perform sterilization techniques. Now, a lot of the th there, there are some things we have to consider when we, when we choose a chemical control agent. Um, one of them is, is it going to leave behind some kind of harmful residue? Um, we have to be very careful about what we're using, if it's going to be something that's going to be put in a patient or if it's going to be something that's going to be um, you know, ingested by someone. Hopefully, it's going to have a broad spectrum of activity. We want something that's going to kill off all kinds of microbes. If you think about something like, like a Lysol, uh, to use a name brand product that kills bacteria, viruses, all kinds of things, um, so it's very broad spectrum. You want it to have a neutral or pleasant odor. Nobody wants a disinfectant that stinks to high heaven. We want something that has a more neutral odor to it, or if it's going to have an odor, let's make it a pleasant odor. We can debate about what a pleasant odor is. We've all smelled some types of aerosols that are just absolutely brutal, and some people think that they are delightful. Um, we don't want it to stain, so we don't want to use something that's going to stain. So iodine is great on skin that you can wash it off. Maybe you don't want to use it as a disinfectant on, for example, a countertop where it might permanently stain that particular, that particular compound. So those are all things we want to consider when we're coming up with some type of, of, of chemical disinfectant. Now, whether we're talking about a physical or a chemical cleaning agent, all of these things are going to have some type of mechanism of action. And we'll talk about mechanisms of action again when we get to antibiotics. Mechanisms of action are the ways in which the particular control agent, physical, chemical, or antibiotic, are actually going to destroy the microbes in question, or at least prevent them from growing. Very common areas of, of microbial biology for physical and chemical control agents uh, to, to impact are going to be either the cell wall, the cell membrane, cellular synthesis, or proteins. 
Those are the four ways in which most chemical or physical control agents operate to do whatever it is that they're going to do, whether the bacteria static or, or, or virostatic or uh, virucidal, so on and so forth. If we're talking about alcohols and detergents, these are things that are going to largely target the cell wall. Detergents also have the ability of acting at the cell membrane. Detergents actually are typically have some sort of bulky, greasy residue. That's why they work so well to remove oils and things like that. That chunky sort of hydrophobic group can actually insert itself into biological membranes and destroy the selective permeability of that membrane. If we're looking at things that are going to disrupt cellular synthesis, i.e. prevent the ability of the cell to reproduce or produce the um, proteins that it needs to survive, uh, these are going to be things like, uh, like um, radiation. So radiation is a great example. It destroys the DNA. No DNA, no ability to actually synthesize proteins from that DNA. Formaldehyde and ethylene oxide are great examples of chemical agents that can be used also to disrupt cellular synthesis, similar to the way that radiation can. They basically make it impossible for that DNA to be transcribed into mRNA and then translated into a protein. On the, we can also directly target the proteins that are needed for a cell to survive. So the receptors, the enzymes, uh, these are all needed for the cell to be able to exist and perform the, their metabolism. Moist heat is a terrific example of this. Moist heat is an excellent way of denaturing proteins and causing them uh, to fall apart and misfold. Alcohol also works at that level. So alcohol not only disrupts the cell wall, but it also disrupts the ability of those proteins to function, and so do most phenolic compounds. So phenols are actually like the original. Uh, if you go way back to Joseph Lister, phenol is what he used to disinfect his cleaning agents, or his, I'm sorry, his surgical instruments, and was sort of the pioneer of aseptic technique. Um, he actually used phenol, and there are other phenol-related compounds that work at the same level to disrupt proteins and thus destroy the microbes. Thank you so much for tuning in today while we discuss the chemical and physical means of controlling microbial growth. In our next video, we'll talk about how we can use antibiotics to do the same thing. Typically, we'll be using antibiotics inside of a human being uh, or another animal to treat an ongoing infection. I hope you guys learned a lot today. I look forward to seeing you guys next time. See you soon. Bye.